everybody. Welcome to the book leads impactful books for life and leadership. I'm your series host and leadership performance coach, John Jeremillo. This podcast series is about getting to the books that have impacted the lives of people in my network. So these are great leads that can share with us great books that have impacted their life, their work, their business, all these worlds that intersect. So I want to get to those books that have made the best impact, the strongest impact on who they are and how they work and operate. And the three kinds of books, category of books that I cover in this series are the first category where they're sharing with me a book that I haven't read. The second category where we're sharing a book we both read, whether specifically for that episode or we read it in our past lives before the series. The third category, when I get to speak to the author and or publishers of the books so they can get the messaging out there, we can get that personal tone of what it is that the book can get out there to the masses, to the people, to the readers. And my guest today is James Hipkin. Over a 40-year career, James worked in marketing and advertising at a high level. Since 2010, he has built his client's business with digital marketing. He's an accomplished forward-thinking marketing professional, and his clients include Sprint, Apple, Wells Fargo Online Bank, Nestle, and Toyota. They appreciate his practical, no-nonsense approach, and he has the scars and the many stories to share. And his stories are always valuable and entertaining. His humor and infectious good nature approach to marketing are fun and practical, but he knew, never loses track of what's important. Marketing well done creates values for uh, value for customers and the business. And James had heard about the series, what I was sharing here, uh, reached out to me, got to knowing each other and understanding each other's work values. And it just makes sense that I have him here for a conversation on the podcast. So James, thank you so much for joining me. John, it's a, it's a complete pleasure being here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. James, so who are you today? I read the bio, but getting into the work that you do, what does that look like in the day-to-day? -day? Can you tell us some of the offerings that you provide for your clients? Anything that kind of gives us a sense of who you are today and the value that you can provide um, to those you work with and just in sharing the book that we're going to go through today? Absolutely. Um, oh. Approximately 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I had an opportunity to buy a vendor. I was managing a digital budget for Toyota. And this was an opportunity to, you know, become semi-retired. My wife, of course, teases me about what part of working from eight in the morning till six at night is semi-retired. <laughs> but what I'm doing now by focusing on website design and development, which is the focus of our day-to-day -day business, the website is the most important digital asset that a business owns. Most of them are terrible. And the reason they're terrible is an absence of strategy. And my background in marketing and advertising was heavily influenced and focused on strategy. You know, getting the right message to the right person at the right time. And that skill set in strategy really lends itself to the work that we're doing today in my little small business, designing and developing websites. Now we have a range of solutions. We do a lot of work with large corporations where we're building a custom solution for them, custom from the ground up, usually has extensive backend integrations with third-party systems or financial systems, enterprise resource planning software. These are big budgets projects and, you know, and it has an, the sort of added value of saying, we actually know what we're doing. Um, six years ago, I created Innately because most smaller businesses, and I'm talking six-figure businesses, couldn't afford to work with us. But when I saw the got off of websites they had, they really should be working with us. So I created Innately as a semi-custom solution that would allow these six-figure business owners who are ready to up their game, who are ready to really put some energy and some, some effort into digital marketing and need a website that supports where they are today, not where they were five years ago when they got their nephew to build them a website. <laughs> um, and who are ready for a more full service upper, um, more f full service solution. So innately is a semi-custom solution that we're developed and, and it's targeted towards the six figure business owner 
who is or who wants to be using digital marketing to drive growth. And that's what brings me great joy and, and satisfaction is I can share my extensive experience in, the, in traditional marketing and digital marketing with these small business owners and, and bring value to what they're doing. Like I said, and like you said in the introduction, the goal here is to create value for the customers and for the business and keeping track of the fact that that both of those things are important is an is another example of applying strategy to the marketing versus just making it pretty james in terms of understanding how you got to that take on your work and in your business today can you give me a sense of where you started whether it was education your first steps into the workforce what did it look like first taking those couple steps into your career and then just kind of like the highlights of, of your story to, to get to where you are today. It, it, it's been an interesting road, John, I've got to tell you. I graduated from college with a music degree. And I know this will shock you, but corporate America is not knocking your door down <laughs> when you have a music degree. I spent the first six years out of college working in the rock and roll industry, touring with major recording artists, stage managing, road managing, that kind of thing. And it was the result of several long conversations with a, a, a Canadian band that I worked closely with uh, that you may have heard of. They're, they're, they're still performing. Uh, the band is Rush. And... Getty Lee, who is the leader of Rush, is a very smart fellow. And they were one of the very first bands to vertically integrate. And I had you know, several conversations with him about the business side of things. And it, he really opened my mind to, I could work in business with my music degree. It, it wasn't incompatible with what was going on. Um, so I the I worked on a big project in, in Southern California called the US Festival. Uh, it was sponsored by Steve Wozniak, the, one of the founders of Apple. And it was a six month long project, very intense. Um, and it was at the end of that project, I decided that no, I didn't wanna keep doing this. I wanted to get a job in advertising. So James, went, how did excuse me? How did uh, Getty Lee put it to you in that conversation? How did he shape that that messaging to you? Well, he talked about how important it was that everybody understand how business works, and you know that what he had done uh, as they had vertically integrated, and what that meant in his world was Rush owned their own record company; they owned their own publishing. They owned their own sound and lights. They owned their own trucks. And when they weren't using the sound and lights and trucks, they would rent them to other bands. And their record company would, would bring on other artists into the record company. So he created a vertically integrated situation where the money was staying with the band. Mm -hmm. You know, which is a very business-like way of thinking about this. Most bands, even today, don't think about that. Um, the contemporary parallel to this is Taylor Swift, mm -hmm. another very brilliant business mind who happens to also be very talented. And, you know, it, it's that's that balancing act between the left brain and right brain, which yeah. is inherent in m music, Music, when it's, if you play it exactly as it's written down, is boring. You have to take that linear expression of music and interpret it in a lateral way. But isn't that marketing? Isn't that how good marketing happens? Marketing is a very disciplined thing, but if to be really successful, you have to be creative about how you interpret the things you're doing. Yeah, when you first spoke about when you just shared about going to school for music and then you joked about, you know, how many corporate 
organizations are looking for music majors and whatnot. But I mean, if somebody has enough interest to go into any kind of business and they have that creative mind, I, I just think I appreciate music. You know, I have mm -hmm. a guitar, a couple guitars, a bass behind me, a, a drum kit. Um, so I've learned to appreciate, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. That's me. But I've learned to appreciate in creativity, especially in music, is just how open you are. You know, if you're dedicated to music, you you want to hear new new ideas. You want to hear new concepts. You want to take from the past and then build your own flavor into it. I mean, we're all inspired by what came before. So I think your message is great. Where and Getty Lee's as well is is just that appreciation for that creative mind. Like there's right. no limit to what you can do, but you got to be open to what's out there. And it's great that it was kind of like a mentor moment that he had with you to kind of just open that up. Cause sometimes all it takes is for somebody to say, haven't you thought about it like this? Yeah. He just opened my mind to this and you know, I don't, wasn't his intention at the time. I think we were just chatting, but um, you said uh, you used a very interesting word when you were just describing and you said that you hear and one of the most important skills that you need to have as a successful marketer is the ability to listen. One of the most important mm -hmm. skills you have to have as a musician is the ability to listen. Mm -hmm. You're working together in it in a more in an organic way with other people. And one of the key mistakes I see when I look at marketing is the marketer isn't listening to what the audience is telling them. The marketer is being what inside out. They're telling the world about how awesome they are and their product and all the things mm -hmm. that their product does. And they're leaving it to the consumer to sort of sort out, well, but what piece of that is for me? Whereas really effective marketing is outside in mm -hmm. it focuses in on the problems that the consumer has the journey that they are on and it supports that journey in in ways that are authentic and in ways that are meaningful to the challenges being faced by the by the by the consumer and that's why i titled my book what i did journey to success and I'm sorry, before I interrupted you, after you said you were going to shift after that festival around that time period, you said you wanted to shift into advertising. Yes. So can you pick up from, I apologize for the interruption, but I was just curious yeah, no what Getty Lee had said to you to kind of put that idea in your brain, but. Well, and, and advertising seemed to be the, the area where my balancing act between left brain and right brain and my ability to, to understand the discipline of things. I mean, when you, when you're, touring, it's a very disciplined business, right? The, the, the reputation that artists has is one thing, but the show is ready to go at eight o'clock. There are no excuses. I mean, there just literally are no excuses. I remember being in a hockey arena somewhere that we'd specced it out ahead of time because the cables that we use for the power are only a certain length. And we've been assured that the power supply was less than that distance. But what they didn't fail to mention was that there was a concrete wall in between the power <laughs> supply and the stage. And, you know, but the show needed to go on at eight. You know, so we installed a hole. <laughs> I've always, I've always been, I love music. I've always been fascinated by, yeah, showing up and knowing that this, these people, the, these bands, whether there was the headliner and the opening acts that they just came here from sometimes a different city the night before or two nights before two nights prior. And they came in here and made this hall, this arena, this whatever amphitheater, their own. It's fascinating. It I can't imagine what goes into it. There's, there's an awful lot of work and having that the balance between that discipline, as well as being able to be creative. And my story of the, the cinder block wall in between the power supply and the stage is an example of being creative about problem solving. And that can apply to 
marketing. That is the essence of marketing is how can you, how can you be creative about something that is fairly, fairly straightforward in terms of its execution. So what did that look like for you? The first couple steps into this new phase of your career, when you went into advertising, what did, what did that look like? Well, I'll tell you, my mother was very happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That I had a real job. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can imagine saying, yeah, that I want to go to school for music. I can imagine just like uh, the stereotypical ideas that parents might have about that, that concern that they might have. Oh yeah. I, well, my, our daughter has every, every parent's nightmare degree combination. She is a BA in English and her major was poetry. Yeah. But she parlayed that into a job at the San Francisco Chronicle, which turned into a job at the Hearst Corporation. And now she's a senior product manager at an ad tech company in San Francisco. See what I mean? When we have those stereotypes about degrees, if you if you fall into that pitfall of the stereotype believing, oh, this poor person in that degree, that means your mind's not open to what it can be. And I think employers are becoming a little more open-minded to what certain degrees can bring to the table. I think yeah. they do understand that they need to meet that person halfway and say, okay, how can I draw out these skills from this person who has this degree? So times are changing, which is good. Yeah, and the liberal arts degree has always been really effective at teaching people how to think. Critical thinking is so absent that when yeah. somebody has it, yeah. they stand out. And I'm quite sure that's what got our daughter's, her start was she showed up, she could speak in full paragraphs that made sense. You know, she was articulate. She had, she was thoughtful and yeah. that comes through and any smart employer is going to go. Absolutely. Yeah, you can have the the nicest looking degree in the world on paper, but if you show up and you can't really communicate who you are, what you find important, um, yeah, you may not have the thirty years of experience, but just that self awareness of what you bring to the table and being able to to put it out there, whether it's in written form, spoken form, sung form, whatever it may be. So, especially like the you know the last ten years of everything that's gone on in this country, I think that communication just that thoughtful communication mm -hmm. is, is what we're missing out on. Well, and perspective. I mean, my career in advertising took me to four different countries on three different continents. And having that perspective of seeing other cultures, having that perspective of, of recognizing that there is no one way to do things, um, you know, opens your mind to things and an awful lot of, of the issues that are going on right now in American politics, I believe, are can be traced to the fact that 80% of the country hasn't left the county they were born in. Mm. And, you know, they've no idea. So they're afraid. Yeah. Yeah. It always comes back to that fear. Mm -hmm. um, fear is yeah. connected to ignorance. Yeah. Absolutely. So James, the, the, the career up until now, advertising, what did that, what did that look like? Well, it was working with clients, helping them, um, you know, see opportunities. Uh, I remember very early in my career, I had, uh, I worked on energizer batteries and I, they were teaching me how to analyze the research reports and all that sort of thing. And, there was a big gap between the actual sales and the sales that were being reported by the research tools. And everybody just kept saying, it's research error, it's research error, it's research error. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But I did think about it. And then one day I called up the product manager and I said, hey, Randy, I'm going I'm to take you to lunch. Okay, that's cool. But before we go to lunch, we're going to park outside a schoolyard. And he's like, now, wait a second. People get arrested for that sort of behavior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm like, no, don't worry. I won't let you get arrested, but it will only take a few minutes. So we parked outside the schoolyard just as the school was letting out for lunch break. 
And all the kids came out into the yard and they had Walkmans and um, it's not politically correct, but ghetto blasters and the rest of it, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, Randy, kids are buying batteries. Nobody is selling batteries to kids. That's why there's such a discrepancy between the sales numbers and the research numbers. You're doing all of your research with 18 plus, 18 to 49, 18. Kids are buying batteries. And I said, I have a friend who owns five record stores in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and he's willing to do a test for you. So we shipped batteries and racks off to these five stores in Winnipeg and tracked the sales results, and they were spectacular. Hmm. So we took that data, that case study, and the Energizer sales force used it to sell into the national record store chains. So my willingness to see around the corners, my ability to see around the corners, opened up a multi seven figure line of distribution that had never been considered before. And James, how did you find that process from shifting from, I'm assuming was it festival promotions when you were working in that festival? Uh, festival? No, we were, I was, Tour, mostly touring with bands and, and okay. producing concerts and that sort of thing where the bands would come to us and we'd produce the concert or I would be traveling with the band as kind of the road manager, tour manager kind of thing. Gotcha. What did that look like shifting from that kind of environment, that kind of work in advertising? Well, so much of what goes on in advertising is about can you work with a team? Can you communicate well to all kinds of different constituents? The, cl the clients tend to be very rational and, you know, all have MBAs and business oriented. The creative department doesn't tend to be any of those things. And I was in the role of being in between those two groups. I had to be able to speak to the clients in ways that the clients could understand and then I had to speak to the creative department in ways that they could understand so that that communication. But isn't that the essence of working with bands? Especially when bands have so many different types of personalities. Exactly. Aside from the musicianship, aside from the artistry, there's just the personalities and it's incredible. But it's not just the bands, it's also the roadies, the, the crews that are working, that are building those stages and tearing those stages down, the technical people who are doing the sound and lights, they all have different skill sets, they all have different, and they all need to work in concert with each other. What does that look like? How many people are we talking, obviously based on the act and the popularity and whatnot, but what, for instance, Rush, how many people are we talking about behind the scenes? Like They're, They usually traveled with 15 people, thereabouts. Okay, okay. And they would hire locally as well. They bring in folks locally, and that was part of this, was to coordinate the local, local folks as well. Like, for example, we, we usually hired a local company that built the stage. Um, so the stage was ready when we showed up. Okay. You know, and doing that advanced work was part of the was part of the gig. What was the the pivotal moment? I guess as you were working in advertising, um, you had referenced it before, but was there a particular moment where you wanted to shift from working in advertising? I'm assuming for a corporate company versus going out to do it yourself. Was there an instant well, yeah, where it clicked? It was, after the long career, there's an awful lot of politics. There's an awful lot of pressure. There's, you know, and it's just, don't tell anybody else, but I'm not 49 anymore. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was just time to, to do something on my own. And um, this seemed to be the, the website piece of it seemed, I've always been comfortable with technology. I'm not a developer, but I am very, I'm very experienced managing technical people. Um, so, and, and I, again, it's the same skill set, right? I have to be able to talk to the designers, talk to the clients, and talk to the developers in ways that they can that they can relate to. 
so that that communication is clear and simple. That skill set is as applicable to what I'm doing today as it was when I worked in advertising. And James, for you, um, what was it? What was it that drove drove you towards music? I mean, what's what's your instrument of choice? What? How did you end up in school for music? You're interested in this. This is how funny. Um, I played the tuba all during high school. And it was, um, my degree was in composition and theory, but uh, I played tuba in classical orchestras, um, classical bands, I mean, just quintets, brass quintet, that kind of thing. Um, so it was mostly classical music, uh, but I was the in the brass section of, a, of an orchestra. Yeah, I mean, it's a major fascination of mine. Um, all things music. Uh, anytime I speak to a musician, I'm always just driven by what drove them to that particular um, instrument. Was it family? Was it curiosity of their own? I have a, I think since the pandemic, I have a deeper appreciation for all things creatives. Mm -hmm. Um I think people are more creative than they think. I think they they think creativity is only musicianship, uh, being an artist, being a painter, a photographer, but there's just so many different areas and ways you can be a creative. So I'm always fascinated, especially when somebody shifts from music focus to business focus to relationship focus, because I think it applies in so many ways that we don't see. Right. And you know, much of my work over the course of my career has been focused around relationship marketing. And I, I wrote the five relationship marketing principles back in the 1990s, and they're still ranked on page one of Google. If you do search for relationship marketing principles, you'll see my writing about this stuff. Those fundamental principles that, and I think that's one of the, the things that I've, when people talk about my secret power, my superpower. It's the ability to distill complicated things down into principles. Mm -hmm. Principles are applicable regardless of the size of your business. Whether you're a multi seven figure budget or a small business trying to, to just figure this out, those principles are universal. And when you understand the principles, a lot of the noise falls away, a lot of the distractions fall away, and it's much easier to, to hone in on what really matters. You know, um, there's this, the famous story of Peter Lynch, who ran the Magellan Fund, financial investment fund, a mutual fund. Uh, and he was being interviewed by a business writer who asked him to what he attributed his success and Magell the business writer was expecting a long and complex answer about, you know, stock portfolios, mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What Lynch said to him was water the flowers and prune the weeds. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's a principle. Hmm. And that's as applicable in marketing as it is an in investment. I tell my clients all the time, stop. You know, you're spending all this time and energy putting videos on TikTok. Has anybody come to your website? Has anybody bought anything as a result of all these videos and TikTok? No. Okay. Then perhaps we shouldn't be spending our energy there. <clears throat> I think that plays so much in the human nature where we overcomplicate everything. Mm -hmm. Like the the more complicated it is, the more technical it is, the more detail there is. We think with each detail, with each step, that it automatically adds value, that it right. shows our commitment to to creating a success, designing a success. So we get in our own ways by overcomplicating everything, seemingly everything. And meanwhile, the consumer... Um, when I uh, I do a lot of public speaking, and one of, one of the things I talk about is the non-icky marketing funnel. And the non-icky marketing funnel presentation features the world's most boring chart. It's a white field with a big gray blob in it. <laughs> That's it. 
And my point is that from a consumer's perspective, it's just a lot of noise. It's just all blends together and it's just this big gray white noise that's going on all around them. It's only when something happens in the consumer's life that triggers them to recognize, huh, I think I may need a, to solve this problem. Suddenly, you're no longer part of the noise. You might be a dot in the middle of the noise. How do you take that first step and then broaden and make yourself more apparent to the consumer? You do that by understanding the journey that the consumer is on. And whether this is a journey that takes five months or a journey that takes 50 seconds. Yeah. Every yeah. consumer goes through the same journey every time from awareness. I guess I better do something about this problem to consideration. What are my choices? What are my options down into prospecting? I have two or three that I need to pick from. Which one do I choose? down to the decision. Mm -hmm. That journey that they are on is the same, whether you're buying a car or you're buying cereal. Yeah. And it happens every time you make a purchase decision. A smart marketer recognizes that, that they need to support that journey. And through the process of supporting that journey, they're going to build trust and build relationship with those consumers. I'll, I'll tell you another story about when I was an executive vice president at an agency in Chicago, we received an RFP from a telecommunications company. We almost didn't accept the RFP because when we did the initial analysis, they were literally losing customers faster than they were gaining customers. They were on track to be out of business in 18 months. But we did follow through on the pitch. We actually won the assignment. And the first thing I did with the marketing director was I said, you need to stop spending money, which of course kind of floored them. <laughs> They're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, because 80% of your revenue is coming from 20% of your customers. You need to understand who that 20% is and what's important to them. Because all the marketing in the world is not going to change a customer's need state. Hmm. But when they need you, you need to be there and you need to be talking to them in their language. And when I we sponsored a research study and the researcher who specializes specialized in loyalty research and I don't remember any of the output from the research study, but I do remember one sentence that he said during his preamble. He said, in his experience, 90% of loyalty problems can be traced to a flawed sales process. And that's why I've been focused so much on understanding the journey, understanding the relationships, how to build those relationships in a way that's authentic in a way that makes the purchase decision the next logical step in their journey versus somebody's been tricked into buying something. Yeah. James, does it make sense from your childhood that this is what you're doing? <clears throat> if yeah. you think about who you were as a child, just in general, not that you knew you were going to end up here, but does it, if you trace back the wonder as a kid, your experience as a kid, your personality, I does it make sense? I grew up in Eastern Ontario in Canada in farm country. We, I was on an island in the Rideau River. We had the river as our backyard and farmer's fields was in our, was our front yard. And it was a idyllic growing up in the country, you know, region, you know, public school, high school, all that stuff. It was a completely foreign no uh, nobody would ever have predicted my life from from that start it's just but this he, is just how it happened but even not in predicting it 
personality wise, whether it's your curiosity, the curiosity, for helping sure. people, whatever it may be, the curiosity for sure. I, I'm quite th sure it was more my inherent curiosity is what got me into music versus any great talent. I wasn't a particularly talented musician, but I was very curious about it. And it was, it was different. It was something that, you know, kept me, kept my brain engaged. Um, and, you know, that's when you grow up in rural Ontario, it's, Keeping your brain engaged is a, is a full-time job. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why I, when I had the opportunity to get transferred overseas from the agency in Toronto, I jumped on it. You know, I, I wanted to get, Canada is an absolutely lovely place and they're absolutely lovely people. And it was a great place to get started, but I wanted to see more. I wanted to experience more and and see how things were done in other parts of the world. And this was an opportunity to do that. Yeah, it's amazing. James, what does leadership mean to you and what does great leadership look like? Well, that's a pivot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of it's kind of building up. Like I want to know, you know, your career, your childhood, how that reconciles. I want to know what you think about leadership before we. The next question is about your book, but I yeah. always want to get a sense of who somebody is, what they think about leadership, the reasons they do what they do, and then jumping into the book. So, as a leadership coach, it's I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Absolutely, I, I'm not. Although I've been in leadership roles for a long time, it's not something I I feel real confident. You know, I can tell you what works for me. I don't know if it's going to work for anyone else, but there's no wrong answer. Just so you know, res respect is so important. Respect is is vital. Respecting. I've worked for some great bosses, and one of the common characteristics is they respected everybody from receptionist to CEO. They respected everybody the same. And one of the, one of the key things I did when I was doing a lot of hiring was I, after the interviews, I would go to the receptionist and say, how did they treat you? because I didn't want to be hiring people who didn't respect others. It's huge. Right? Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is patience and, and recognizing that nobody comes to work with the intention of doing a bad job. I, that's my going in premise always. And that, you know, mistakes are gonna happen. I remember in the corner office in Chicago, one of my direct reports showed up with one of the junior account executives. And she had been frustrated with her client and had expressed her frustration in an email and had accidentally hit reply all. Uh. Okay. She was standing there. She was ashen. She was sure she was going to be fired. Now, I knew, heard about this. Several of my clients had called me. And they, you know, but and the general, the general consensus amongst my clients was the, the assessment of the junior account executive was correct. But I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I asked her if you know what she felt was wrong about what she'd done and she explained it and I asked her if she was ever going to do that again and she assured me that she wasn't and that was it we just let it go from there this that young woman in that day is now a very successful chief marketing officer in Silicon Valley You know, patience and and 
you know, empathy for the situation that people are in as another, I think, key piece to leadership. And that's, I think, why, you know, much to my wife's amazement, people like me and people keep coming back and wanting to work with me again. And, you know, they call me up. I've got a, a call this week with a, wo a woman who's currently president of an agency in New York who's, you know, I reached out to her and said, hey, I'm working on a couple of things. Would you take, give me a few minutes of your time? And she's like, absolutely. You know, she's president of a New York ad agency. She's busy. <laughs> yeah. Those are huge, though, and I appreciate those. I mean, everybody gives great answers because they give it from their experience. I said there's no cookie cutter right response, but I love those two because they they show some grace to others, you know, respect, patience. Um, and I think there's so many people that are coming up through their career might get blindsided by not being respect, not finding that courtesy, not finding that patience. And if 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 you strike out at somebody like that when mm -hmm. they're developing, I mean, it just it sets a tone for the rest of their career. Absolutely. Um, in the way that the function, the way that they think, the way that they evaluate themselves. And if you're somebody that's respected that person and you say to them, are you going to do it again? And they're like, no. And you're like, all right, you know, water under the bridge. And then there's just something about when you get respect from a leader. It sounds ridiculous that you have to say this, but there's something about getting respect from a leader mm -hmm. that makes people shine that makes people come through and and want to come through for that leader and right. you don't see it too often and when you see it in play it's amazing it, it, it always piques my curiosity okay why are you like that as a leader what is it that makes you respectful as a leader it's in, insane that you have to ask that question right. where does that respect come from um and I think it is missing, unfortunately, in so many environments. And I think it hits the bottom line when you get that mm -hmm. turnover and that churn. So I appreciate uh, appreciate those responses, James. Well, and honesty is another thing that I think is really important. That you know, you pe be honest with people. Yeah. And that's good news. That's bad news. That's just be auth authentic and honest. And and people may not be happy with what you're saying, but they will appreciate that you're being honest with them. Um, you know, I, this websites are complicated software, things break. I can't tell you the number of times I've received phone calls from clients that, you know, something wasn't working or something stopped working, et cetera, et cetera. And they're all worked up about it. And I'll say, you know, are any puppies going to die? <laughs> yeah. And that usually just stops them in their tracks. Yeah. And they're like, uh, probably not. I say, yep. So something broke. We'll figure out what broke. We'll fix it. Nobody will remember in 24 hours. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, another rare sil silver lining to the pandemic is just prioritizing what's really important. Mm -hmm. where somebody might make a mistake and maybe before the pandemic might have, the boss might have flown off the handle after hopefully if they've learned the lesson of the pandemic and people quiet quitting and reprioritizing their values and what they want to get out of the work they realize you know it is important the business is an ongoing concern you have to be there and and, and keep it going but you know there's got to be room for some mistakes to get, there has to be some kind of latitude and understanding so i think those are all great great ideas great concepts that you're sharing Right. And they result in good business. I mean, one of the most expensive things that a business owner faces is turnover. Employee churn. My, my employee churn is less than 10%. And it's incredible these days in age, at this day and age when, you know, technology is ubiquitous. You got the Twitter, the Facebook uh people sharing stories of their work environments um it's crazy in that i would want somebody to be authentic in these ideas that you're sharing respect courtesy patience all that even if that's not something you want to do even if it just doesn't occur to you even if you don't you don't want to deal with the soft stuff mm -hmm. 
you gotta you gotta know that people talk people share people vent about the environments that are toxic so mm -hmm. it will get out it will get around your reputation will be tarnished that it's right. not just do what what you do externally but also what you do internally and how you treat people internally that's right. gonna set the reputation for your company right. i mean much much like that the the president of the advertising company in new york reaching out yeah. to you because you've set that that tone for mm -hmm. your work it's not just your employees right but those that's one of the values of the work that you put out it's built on that attribute of just respect right and and she and i have worked together in the past uh we've also competed against each other she was running a department at Chiat Day in Los Angeles when I was running an agency in San Francisco and we were both pitching for a project with Apple. Chiat Day was the agency of record for Apple. But I won the business. Yeah. And I remember her calling me up and giving me such crap. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know. That's awesome. It's when the when the relationship is rooted in respect and the relationship is rooted in trust it all these things are just things that happen they're not showstoppers yeah great points so james in jumping into the book can you introduce your book um and just kind of share with us how it happened how you came to write the book sure um i wrote the book during the pandemic uh, and if you want, give the title, the full title too. It's Journey to Success, Digital Marketing for Small Business Owners. And I wrote the book because of the many conversations I had with our clients um, you know, who, who are trying to get into digital marketing and are overwhelmed and confused by all of the options. What I'm trying, what I tried to do with the book, I wrote it as a parable because business books are boring, right? So I wanted them to be entertaining. I wanted it to be interesting. So I wrote the, the story of John and his family. They owned a custom bike shop and they were getting killed by online marketing. And they knew that they had to start doing something themselves. And it's the story of their journey from nothing to being successful with digital marketing. And during the course of that journey, it talks about the mistakes that they made, the things that they learned, the fundamental principles that they came to recognize. There's an outside consultant, who's me, <laughs> <laughs> named Kyle in the book, um, who they hire in to, to help them, you know, with key things and key things and Kyle, you know, helps them understand the pathway that they need to be on. So it's the story of that I think is very, very typical for a lot of small business owners who are getting frustrated that their traditional marketing channels are not nearly as efficient as they used to be and that they need to start using digital marketing. And they probably are trying to use digital marketing, but they really don't know how to think about it. And they get overwhelmed by the so many options and so many things going on and all these shiny things flying through and the squirrel running by and it, you know, it just becomes overwhelming. And so I wrote the book with that intention in mind to bring some clarity to a small business owner so that they could have their journey to success as well. Digital marketing, I mean, if the pandemic has done, did nothing, it opened the minds of so many people that online shopping is not that hard. I can jump in and just ask, because I'm always curious if there was a particular moment that you said, I want to, I need to write a book. So we can start from there if you'd like. Well, I needed, it was during the pandemic when things slowed down and I had time on my hands and I, I just, it's always in the back of my head. I needed to, get, I like writing. Words and I have always gotten along well. My blog is very deep, pages and pages of articles about marketing, just because I'm trying to get that information out there. So it was was not a difficult chore. I, I quite enjoyed it, actually. And it was 
these ideas are important. You know, business is important. These small business owners are, it's the backbone of the American economy. And digital marketing is not going away. And, you know, a lot of things are shifting. I mean, I have the, I have the scars. I mean, when I started, the facts did not exist. Never mind email and the internet. The facts didn't exist when I started. I mean, I remember making presentations to clients from acetates. And you have to be a certain age to know what acetates were. <laughs> um, funny story, I was rushing to a client meeting with a deck of acetates for the presentation we were about to give. And I, I tripped going up some stairs and discovered the importance of page numbers. Uh, uh. <laughs> and did you make it through that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No puppies died. <laughs> what do you think that that comes from in you, James? That idea, no puppies died. Like, what is that? What is that respect? What is that um, consideration come from in you? <laughs> Good luck. Like, is it, is it a Canadian thing? I don't, I, well, no, I don't think it's necessarily a Canadian thing. Um, on, the, on the flip side, Canadians have got passive aggressive down to an art form. <laughs> so <laughs> they're not of perfect those either. Yeah. Um, which drove me batty. You don't agree with me. Just tell me you don't agree with me. I'll, I, I can handle it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I have no idea where it came from, but, um, my upbringing, my experiences in high school, I was involved with sports in high school as well as music. Um, uh, it's a Canadian sport called curling. I was on the high school curling team and we were one of the best curling teams in the country. Um, so I worked at a competitive level, uh, this, us uh, scraggly boys, there's a thing called a cash bond spiel where all of these men each submit it's four men in a team. So you each put in a hundred bucks and back in the 1970s, hundred dollars, a lot of money. And, um, and the winner of the bond spiel would get the cash prize. And then this runner up would get a smaller cash prize and et cetera, et cetera. And we used to go into these cash bond spiels as teenagers with all these men. And they were all like, well, that's, this is an easy buy into my next round. No problem at all. Basically, that paid for my first year of college. <laughs> so it, just learning a combination of life, sports, paying attention. Um, I, I can't point to any one thing that that set me on a path. My curiosity, I think, is the common denominator through it all. I was always curious and always wanted to understand why things mm -hmm. were the way they were. And, you know, that applied to music, that applied to, you know, marketing, advertising, how clients worked, um, understanding that, you know, the the delicate dance that is people talking to each other. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I had to have a difficult conversation with one of my, I work as a fractional CMO as well. Um, it sort of keeps me busy. Um, and I had to have a difficult con conversation with one of my fractional CMO clients last week it, Basically, I had to tell the principal guy in this company, you need to stop talking in meetings. You're, you're not following the dance that's going on and you're disrupting it. You know, and that's, these are things that you learn over the course of time that, you know, it, you know, a, a client needs to be prepared to hear that. And if they're not mm. prepared to hear that, they probably shouldn't be your client. Yeah. I was just, I just shared something on LinkedIn about that. When I came some across a post um, 
on the book Radical Candor. And I shared it. Um, I shared the post and just spoke to my own nature. And, and people have told me I can be very honest. And it's never with the intention of putting them down, putting them aside, coming out ahead. I just have learned like that's to me, that's respect much in the same way you're talking about speaking to your client. I mean, that's a matter of business as well. Yes. But if, if you let just, if you let somebody just run haphazard and you don't have the wherewithal to stop them as, as much as it may hurt, you said plenty of times in this conversation, you've had tough conversations to give them the truth, mm -hmm. to have the respect, to give them the truth. Mm -hmm. To me, it comes down to respect. You know, and it's respecting my time. It's respecting your time, all the work that our team has put together, if there is a team. But yep. I think there's just so much importance to speaking the truth in a, in a certain way. And the, I think the more you use it, the more you utilize it, the better you are at demonstrating, listen, it's not about me. It's not about ego, but we need to stop this, whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's about having a having clarity on the larger vision. Yeah. As, a, as I said to the to this particular client, I says, I don't disagree with what you were saying, but it wasn't appropriate in that moment and it derailed the conversation. Yeah. So you, you need to, you know, take your cues, you know, and if you can't take the cues, then just don't talk. Yeah. Because it, it's just not helpful. No, agreed. James, can you give a, just a brief overview of the book? What's the path you take the reader down um, as you're trying to assist these small business owners in the digital marketing space? What does that look like? How do, how do you lead them through and navigate um, that field? Well, it it's, runs parallel with a lot of business owners' actual experience based on the conversations I've had with them. They usually decide that this is something that they need to do. So they go out and they try something and it, it invariably doesn't work. And the hurdle that they need to get past is, did it not work because it's a bad idea or did it not work because they didn't execute it well? And understanding the differences between those things and having, you know, the, willingness to make mistakes the the key part of a key aspect of successful marketing is testing yeah and testing by its inherent nature means most of the time it's you're going to get it wrong and if you're not getting it wrong most of the time you really aren't testing enough yeah and so and that acceptance that you're you're that's the first part of the book is the the family the son and the daughter are trying different things and it's not going well but the parents you know their additional maturity and experience their family meeting you know they have this conversation around is this because of what we're doing or is this because of how we're doing it? And maybe we need to talk to somebody else who can bring some additional experience and that's when they bring in Kyle. So it's that, that developing relationship, which is in essence what it is, is that they're developing a relationship with digital marketing from not knowing anything about it to actually becoming very successful using it and following their journey. I mean, it, the journey thing is I talk a lot about, you know, customer avatars and the buyer's journey map. Most people will recognize what an avatar is or persona is another way it's sometimes labeled. But when I ask them, so have you mapped the buyer's journey? Uh, invariably, they'll say no. And the avatar is only half the battle. The understanding, the avatar helps you understand who you're talking to and what's important to them. What are the, what is their pain? Uh, who are they like as people? Who are they like demographically? This helps with media selection. This helps with messaging. Um, but the journey maps what stimulates their awareness initially 
through what are the kinds of questions and obstacles they're trying to overcome as they're doing their research, through to the what are the factors that really influence the decision-making process. And these questions are similar, but they're not the same. And recognizing these questions is, is, is key because if you're writing a blog post that on a, a quick, quick tangent, in the world of SEO, everybody focuses in on keyword research mm -hmm. and keyword research is clearly very important, but everything is two sides. The other side of keyword research is search intent. You can find a keyword, but if the search intent is in the consideration phase, the content that you need to create looks one way. If the search intent is transactional, then the content you're going to create is very different. And that is a practical example of recognizing that consumers are on a journey and creating your content marketing to support the journey that your best customer is on mm -hmm. versus shouting at them about how awesome you are. Huh. James, I'm curious, in writing this, did anything evolve in you? Did the way you looked at anything shift based on your writing this book? I, it's, I'm not that profound a person, no. <laughs> 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 That's fine. I'm just always curious that when somebody's putting down their knowledge uh, into a, a volume or a series, whatever it may be, if it shifted the way they looked at um, what they're writing about. I had um, to be I had to be very ruthless about the editing. I had to be very ruthless because it's written for a very specific audience and I needed to practice what I preach. Yeah. Um, I have a great deal of technical knowledge about marketing and advertising, and I needed to be very careful that I didn't push too much of that technical knowledge into the book because that would not have been appropriate yeah. for the audience that the book was design, designed for. So that and was- As somebody that's not overly technical, I appreciate that. Yeah. And that's uh, the feedback I've gotten from people who've read the book is that it's a really clear treatise on how to think about digital marketing as a small business owner it has, gives you enough information that lets you understand the steps you need to take and how you need to think about things, but doesn't overwhelm you. What do you think is next for your writing? I, we're working on a workbook right now that's going to be a companion to the, to the, to journey to success where this journey to success is a story. Um, and the other feedback I've gotten from people is, can you give me some tools? Can you give me some, and I've got the tools. So we're, we're working on a workbook right now that's going to support the, 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 the story. Um, and then I continuing to write uh, in my blog, uh, you know, articles about digital marketing where I'm trying to make things clear. Um, the most recent article I wrote, which I got a bit carried away, it ran to over 7,000 words. Um, <laughs> but it was so many business owners get swept up in paid ads online and they don't understand the fundamentals. Paid advertising online, pay per click, Google yep. AdWords, it should be a revenue faucet. It should be structured because they give you all of the tools to measure things. They give you all of the, and they want you to be successful. Mm -hmm. And if, and it can be a revenue faucet where you can just turn it up and turn it down as you need to increase your leads or decrease your leads, depending on your workflow, once yeah. it's been tuned. But the key thing that, you know, I talk about is first of all, are you, are you budgeting correctly? Because most people don't know how to budget. They, you know, the, 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 you see online people saying, well, 10% of your sales should be used to mark for marketing. No, that's not correct. Yeah. You you want to understand your what I what the old direct marketing term for it is the allowable cost per order. 
And that's a profit first calculation that determines how much you can afford to spend to get a customer. The second piece of this is water the flowers and prune the weeds. You know, be disciplined about what's working and what's not and put more budget against the things that are working and put less budget against the things that are not. Don't try to push your own ideas onto the data. And the third piece is patience. Mm -hmm. We talked about patience earlier. I, I can't tell you the number of times. Well, I tried Google AdWords, it didn't work. Um, how long did you run the campaign for? I don't know, two weeks, three weeks? No, you need at least three months to properly train the system and to properly understand how it works. And this is coming from a person who's managed multi seven figure digital ad budgets. So I, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and these, these base, but these basic principles get missed by a lot of people. So that's what I like to write about is how to, how to these you know, making these principles clear in terms of, you know, things like we just talked about SEO, keyword research, really important. Search intent is as important. Mm -hmm. And yet it gets short shrift. People don't talk about it. James, just talking about books, talked about what you're going to do for your writing. I'm just curious, what book has inspired you or left an impact on you? Is there a book that stands out? There's a couple of them. Um, there's a book was written a lo long time ago. It may still be available called The Loyalty Effect. The, the author was, his name was Reichheld. He was a consultant at the Boston Consulting Group. And he talked about loyalty and the impact that loyal customers can have on a business. Hmm. And that was a very powerful and important, you know, thing for me in my past. Another important, again, it's another old one, it's Crossing the Chasm. Crossing the Chasm talks about the interest curves. People talk about, you know, early adopters, late adopters, early majority, late majority, laggards, all this stuff, right? What they don't talk about is the fact that there are gaps between these groups. And there's the biggest gap is between the adopter set folks and mm -hmm. the early majority. So many businesses fail because they don't cross the chasm. You know, I, as a, an example, I, this wasn't my idea, but I did work on the project. We were charged to, in Northern California, to uh, launch the the new new model of the Prius. This is when the Prius went from that sort of boxy shape to the teardrop shape. This is mm -hmm. years ago. Everybody else in the country was busily marketing the Prius as a hybrid car that was good for the environment. We didn't do that. We got a lot of heat for this, but we didn't do that. In Northern California, we marketed the Prius as an economical family car because it was a hybrid. Because we understood that the early majority, while they certainly recognized that the environment was important, they had practical considerations. Mm -hmm. Okay, John, we sold more Priuses in Northern California than the rest of the country combined. That's an example of crossing the chasm. Yeah. And I mean, that's so many, so many considerations that people don't take into account. It's amazing how blind we are to what businesses go through, especially the successful ones, how mm -hmm. strategic it is. We just see that final product. Meanwhile, you guys are behind the scenes taking in all these considerations. Right. And sometimes having to swim yeah. upstream. Trust me, we got a <laughs> when when we told you know, corporate that that's is what we were planning to do. They were like freaking out. They didn't freak out so much after the first year of sale. <laughs> James, and starting to wrap up, what are you up to these days? Is there anything else that I should have asked? Anything you want to share here? Um, 
so that I don't miss anything while I have you here. Anything at all, the floor is yours. Well, I tell you, one of the things I often tell people, digital marketing is very confusing and overwhelming. It doesn't have to be. If you understand the journey your customer is on and you provide marketing to support that journey, you're, it's going to be successful. The other thing that I counsel people, stop trying to boil the ocean. Pick a few things, figure out what's working, do more of what's working and less of what's not. And when you think you've got it right, figure out how to do it better. <laughs> uh, great advice. And again, uh, we covered James's own book, Journey to Success, Digital Marketing for Small Business Owners. James, thank you so much for sitting down with me. John, it's been my pleasure. I really appreciate it. And thank you for patience with the, the banging on the roof. Um, <laughs> life happens. Life yes, happens. Life I, like happen. I told you before, I've had dogs walk into the screen and babies. I mean, it's just life, you know. Um it's the same patience and, and courtesy and whatever you had when something didn't go as planned. It's just, you roll with the flow, we've provided value and that's the most we can do. That's right. And, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, if you're, if you're authentic, it's going to work for you. Absolutely. That's a great, uh, great uh, advice right there to end on. If there's anything that I might have missed in my conversation with James, there's so much to cover. I have him for a limited time. Please reach out. Let me know. I'll reach out to him, see what kind of additional guidance, insight, knowledge I can get back. Uh, in the meantime, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.